Okay, good morning. Um, today we are going uh, to speak about uh, two topics. The first one is implicit neural representation, and the second one which is related is uh, neural rendering. First of all, uh, I would like to take the opportunity and to thank to uh, Lior Yariv, Yoni Kasten, and Matana Tzmon for fruitful and very interesting discussion with them. So let's uh, start. So uh, in the previous lecture, we discussed a lot the topic of uh, representation of shapes. When we speak about shapes, essentially we're interested in 3D representation in the output space, for example, as a result of some reconstruction process. Um, and I would like to ask the question, why do we speak about implicit shapes? Um, uh, so let's try to see the uh, disadvantages of using explicit uh, uh, representation in the output space. So uh, we have the, uh, the voxel representation, which uh, uh, can be very extensive to use uh, in terms of memory usage. And then we have the point cloud representation uh, and the triangular mesh representation, <clears throat> where uh, in this situation, the, the point cloud suffer from uh, um, uh, misinformation of connectivity, uh, while the mesh holds this information. But in order to get in the output space some uh, representative mesh, actually we start from some template mesh and we deform it. And this is actually uh, a problem because we cannot get different topology than, than what we started the, in the beginning. So actually, it seems like that the idea of this discretization of the output space is less attractive than, than implicit shape, which have uh, actually the, the uh, a representation in the continuous domain, okay? So <clears throat> here comes the idea of using implicit functions. So how to represent a shape with an implicit function? For example, here we have this L shape. Uh, we are interested in a function such that in the outside, it will be positive. In the inner side of the shape, it will be negative, and on the shape itself, it's going to be zero. In other words, we can say that implicit shape representation is like writing a shape as a zero level set, like what's written here, uh, of some function f. Okay? Of course, um, given a shape, we can have several ways to represent it implicitly. For example, one popular choice is the indicator function, which says that, the, that inside we are going to have uh, negative values and outside we are going to have, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, the inside we are going to have negative values, the outside we are going to have a, a positive values. And, um, the, and, the, and the shape itself is going to be zero on the shape itself. On the other end, there is something which we already know, it's what we call sine distant uh, function, such that uh, what characterizes this function is that the inner points have negative distance to the shape, and the outer point have uh, a positive distance to the shape. And on the shape itself, we have zero, okay? This is the zero level set. <clears throat> what I would like to say now uh, it's it's the, the advantages of the implicit representation are the following. So first of all, we have continuous representation, and, and therefore we can represent arbitrary topology and at arbitrary resolution. This is not limited by uh, by, by excessive memory requirements, and also we can actually uh, move for, by some processing uh, to geometric quantities like normals. And very importantly, this blend, blend very well with deep learning techniques, and we'll see later on how. Okay? Now, uh, of course, we cannot work with all set of function. The idea is to have some basis of function. We call it phi1 to uh, phi n, such that 
uh, the uh, implicit function is going to be in the span of this uh, uh, linear basis. And it goes like this. Every function that I want to uh, introduce is a mixing, and the mixing is by the, this wi of the, line, of the linear of the basis function, okay? And this wi are going to be modulated according to the data, okay? So uh, uh, very uh, popular way to uh, use a linear basis and to, uh, a, 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 to use implicit representation is by doing the following uh, scheme, take some data points in the, in the space, for each data point associated radial basis function or such as Gaussian, for example, such that the center of the radial basis function is, uh, uh, is the center of the, of, the, of the function. And then each phi i like this contribute to the uh, linear combination of the function which we want to represent. Okay. Recently, uh, many works uh, have shown that it's possible to uh, use a, a, to represent implicit function by by uh, neural nets. So let's take the, the the simplest example. I have just one layer and I have a ReLU activation. So phi i the basis function is such that on the one side it's uh, affine function, and on the other side it's zero, and f actually is a combination of this affine function when the ReLU is applied to the affine function, times wi. Note that this is different from what we had before, because here we also optimize for the ai and bi and wi. The functions are not given uh, straight from as before. And in this sense, this is not linear as in the previous case. Actually, this is, this is non-linear representation, implicit, rep rep implicit neural representation, OK? Now we can generalize it. We can take more uh, uh, layers, and we can think of the, uh, of the uh, neural net such that each neuron in the last layer actually represents a basis function, which is multiplied by wi. Okay, and then the situation can be more and more complicated, and we look for the wi's and also on. We, we look for also on the weights inside the, the net, okay? So uh, this is something which is more complicated. In this manner, you can represent very complicated uh, shapes. Actually, in a paper by uh, uh, Matana Tzmon and other people in the group uh, from your own Lipman groups, the paper is called Controlling Neural Label Set. They showed univers universality, which means that any a uh, watertight piecewise linear surface can be exactly represented as a neural level set of MLP with value activations. Okay? What do I mean by watertight uh, uh, mesh? Watertight mesh is actually a surface without holes where the inside and outside of the surface is clear. Okay? Uh, so uh, any, for example, a sphere is a watertight mesh, okay? But if you make a hole in the sphere, it's no more a, a watertight mesh. Torus, a water, it's a watertight mesh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here they speak about watertight meshes with such that piecewise linear, and they show that it can be represented exactly with an MLP with regular activations, okay? Okay. So what is what is a piecewise linear? Piecewise linear, I mean that you can think of a mesh that is, uh, for example, made of triangles that are continuous, okay? You take a bunch of triangles yes. and the, the, in a continuous way you uh, merge them, you make such a surface, okay? Um, yes, thanks. No problem. Okay, so uh, the, the, the main question is how to learn implicit neural representation, or in other words, in terms of neural net, how to find the parameters theta in order to achieve good approximation to the uh, surface shape or manifold, okay? And uh, at first, in the beginning of this uh, uh, nice uh, topic, uh, uh, few works emerged and suggested, suggested regression with full 3D supervision. What do I mean by that? 
somehow you calculate a, um, a implicit representation like sine distance transform or occupancy met occupancy uh, uh, indicator function somehow how by supervised many you calculate it then you sample points in some manner on the shape and actually you take this value at this point and you solve an optimization problem by reg regression optimization problem such that the neural net will be uh, close as possible to the uh, a sampled point okay this is uh, the, the this is was the first direction in this uh, topic um, but the question is from where do I get such um, supervised uh, implicit function okay so let's take for example let's take a look at a, at a nice uh, work that uh, uh, followed this idea the work is called occupancy, occupancy network um, <clears throat> and they uh, suggested the following idea we'll represent the 3d geometry of the shape by the decision boundary of a classifier that learns to separate the object from the inside and outside of the object <clears throat> Then this yields a continuous implicit surface representation. Having that, and it inference, I can query on 3D points. And this will allow me to construct water type meshes by using some algorithm, which is called Martian Cubes algorithm. Let's dive into the details. OK? So the occupancy network works like this. You learn nonlinear function, actually from R3 to uh, the interval between 0 and 1. The input is actually a point in R3, and the output is the probability of occupancy. OK? Now, uh, um, the decision boundary is going to be some uh, value, which we'll call it tau. And uh, for example, tau can be uh, 0.5. And this represents the surface of the reconstructed shape. So let's take a look at this example. For example, in this synthetic example, this is the uh, uh, decision boundary between the red points and the blue points. And also here, you see predicted points, red and blue. And actually, the surface itself is the decision boundary between these points. OK? Um, after, uh, uh, I would like to uh, note something which I forgot to say before. It's important to note that when you train a neural net uh, for some, uh, uh, for some, in a training process to learn some uh, a, a, an object or a class or something like this, actually the neural net itself represents the object by the weights of the neural net. Okay, so when you are done with the training, you have some very complicated representation, which is uh, actually the weights of the neural net. So having that. After you uh, make the uh, training process, you can actually infer uh, uh, the surface, like here, for example, and uh, have it uh, in a mesh representation, like here. Okay. So, in details, what they do here, they uh, study a class specific uh, situation, for example, class of cars, class of chairs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The input to the uh, to the uh, to the neural net are 3D location in space, actually. And the output is a occupancy probability between 0 and 1. Actually, when you learn class, you learn from many observations. Okay? So each observation was uh, uh, associated with some uh, latent representation or feature vector, which is denoted here by, by C. For example, when you think about uh, uh, point clouds, you can use, for example, the very famous encoder, a, a very famous encoder, which is called point net, such that when you let the encoder have the uh, the point cloud, okay, which is a collection of three D uh, of a point in R three, you'll get some uh, uh, latent space representation feature vector, and then you'll take this latent space representation, you'll put it here, and you can go with your a uh, uh, with your uh, uh, network uh, and do the training and then do the inference okay so here for example what they show here 
they they show that you can they can make pond cloud completion. For example, here this is the input, which just pass your set of the point cloud of this uh, table, and this is the output table. Okay, and this is the okay. output. From this, uh, somebody has to mute himself. Okay, this is the input, and this is the output. For example. Now let's dive into the training process and the data preparation. It's important to understand to understand why it's not so good to you to to make full 3D supervision. So this is the loss. What what we have here in the loss, we have an observation. I don't know n chairs or n point cloud of chairs, for example. In each observation, we sample k points. Okay, l small l is the cross entropy classification loss between the prediction of the network, okay, given some sample point on observation I, sample point J, and OIJ is actually the occupancy value, number between zero and one, that uh, in some supervised manner, they uh, manage to output it, okay? And then you minimize this loss and you get the results and the net and the representation by net that we just uh, saw. Actually, after training, the weights of the neural net represent uh, the class. Very nice. However, what is, what is the problem? The, the problem is that the full 3D supervision, in some sense, demand the surface reconstruction. What do I mean by that? If I have, for example, a point cloud, and then I'm moving for, from a point cloud to a mesh, in order to know whether a point resides on the mesh or does not reside on the mesh, in other words, whether uh, the occupancy value is closer to zero or closer to one, as you remember from our last class, it takes uh, it's ex expensive work to, uh, to uh, determine whether a point resides on my mesh, inside the mesh, outside the mesh, et cetera, et cetera. It's extensive work. So actually, it can be an it can be annoying to uh, uh, use such full 3D supervision. Maybe there is another way that can, we can take and continue without full 3D supervision. Okay, and this is the idea. How you, sorry, how how do you generate the point clouds? Generating the point cloud, I assume that, that the point cloud is given like as a uh, uh, part of some data set. Okay, the point cloud is given, or you can think about a laser scanner or something like this. The raw data is given. The problem is the supervised uh, process. Okay, is it clear? Yeah. Okay. So now we are going to uh, speak about many works uh, that suggest to work with weak supervision. Actually, to study to make the training from the raw data for example directly from point clouds or directly from two-dimensional images okay so in with respect to the point cloud what do we want we want that given a, a, a point cloud with point xi we would like to compute theta theta is the parameter of the neural net such that f of a point in theta approximately give me the sine distance function to a function to sorry to a surface that defined well the point cloud okay but i want to do this without any additional supervised data preparation let's see uh, how it is done uh, by some nice work also from your own group uh, where uh, the first author is uh, Amos uh, Grob the work is called Implicit Geometric Regularization, in short, IGR, okay? So we are all familiar with the iconal uh, uh, partial differential equation. We know that this is a nonlinear partial differential equation due to this uh, constraint, that the magnitude of the gradient everywhere is going to be one. And on the shape itself, the function is going to be zero. Actually, uh, if the manifold is nice uh, and under some other mild condition, you will get a unique solution to the Aquilon equation, and the solution will be the sine distance function. Okay. Now, 
what happens if I'm moving from this nice uh, uh, surface manifold to something which breaks the rules? What do I mean by that? I have just a sample of point, I call it omega, and I want to say that on this sample of point, the function is going to be zero, and I would like to get a sine distance function. Could I get it? So let's, let's think about it in terms of the iconal partial differential equation. In terms of the iconal partial differential equation, actually, this is an imposed problem. What I mean by that, I can have a lot of solution. For example, in this case, <clears throat> the left one is a solution to the iconal equation, and the right one is a solution to the iconal equation. Both of them are solution. The left one is smooth, the right one is just more crazy, okay? However, think about the following loss, okay? In the following loss, I would like to optimize theta such that on the sampling point, f is going to be, be vanish. On some other more rich set of points, I would like to introduce the following soft constraint that the gradient is, will, will be as much as possible close to one, okay? Now, if I'm going to take this loss and optimize it by some MLP, actually complicated MLP, not just one layer, okay? I would get that the resulting solution, sorry for that, is exactly this, not the other one. And this happens due to uh, the regularization that is a property of the MLP, okay? The MLP tends to let you have more regularized solution, more smooth solution. This property can be, can be also seen in these examples. These are the sample point in white, for example, here on the sphere, and that's what, this, uh, the, what, that's what the MLP give us when you optimize this loss, okay? This is also true in 3D. You take uh, um, a cloud of point, a point, point cloud, you, you optimize the loss, and here you see uh, reconstruction using a marching cube, like, like I said before, and here are the level set. The white is the zero level set, and in blue it's the uh, uh, inside level set and the outer uh, level sets, okay? So, we see that uh, um, in opposed to uh, solving some uh, non-linear partial differential equation, which is ill-posed, in some way, the neural net solve the ill-posed equation by introducing some regularization and let you have the, a more smoother solution. So this is uh, very good. And actually, there are some nice theorem in the papers that say the following, actually, the theorem it's a very uh, simple situation, but, but not easy to prove that if you uh, make gradient descent uh, of a linear model with random initialization, with probability one, you will converge to the producing plane. Actually, uh, when you uh, uh, take some points and you uh, would like to solve this uh, optimization uh, loss such that uh, the function is uh, expressed by y times xi, okay? And you look for a, actually a w, sorry, you look for w. Uh, then you will always uh, boil down to this solution, to this uh, smooth solution. Okay? Everything is clear? So um, this is very nice uh, uh, work, uh, which is called IGR. Let's continue to see uh, some other nice works. Sorry, I have a question. Yes. So with, with this regularization, so basically the, it, the, the convergence to, to the shortest line between the points? To the smoother, I would say the smoother one in some, in because. some, yes. Also the, yes, the shorter, uh, yeah, in some, in some manner, yes, yeah. To the smoother okay, one. Because, yeah. because uh, two slides ago, I think, we showed the sample of uh, here. So the shortest line here would be the point between the two circles in the middle, right? And so, and you're saying that it will converge into this circle black line in the middle? Yeah, this one, yeah. So what, 
I would say the, I would say the smoother it's, it's, one. It's not I the shortest. Would, okay, okay. I would say the smoother one. Okay, it will converge to the smoother one. It it not it not not make juggling like this. Okay, that's what I mean by that. It will take the smoother path. Okay. okay so it's a bit uh, hard to to imagine. Okay. Not to imagine to understand exactly what is the uh, you know. The organization. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I think about it. The theory Thanks. is with respect to this case, and the results are with respect to many complicated way, case also in 3D, like this. And uh, actually, uh, the uh, smoother property of neural nets are common in other situation, not only in situation like this, uh, neural nets tend to converge more uh, to, to uh, a, a, some uh, modes which are smoother than modes which, which, are, which, which, has, which have higher frequencies. Actually, later on, you will see it also in other uh, examples. But this is the regularization property converging to smoother modes and not high frequency modes. This is the idea. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah, you said that this is a weak supervision, right? Yeah. Why is this so weak? Because I'm using just the point cloud, and I'm not using any other information like uh, occupancy maps or side distance function. I'm not generating something supervised on top of this point cloud. OK? OK. So let's move on to the second part of the of the of this uh, class, neural rendering. Uh, we discussed it a bit in the previous lecture. I just want to remind you the uh, the definition. So what is neural rendering? It's deep image generation that enable explicit or implicit control of scene properties such as illumination, camera uh, parameters, pose, geometry, appearance, and semantic structure, and actually paves the way to reconstruction and rendering. Uh, uh, such that we can get uh, uh, novel images after training. This is very nice. And also here, we are interested in neural rendering exactly like before from raw data, from two-dimensional images only. And we want to build on implicit neural representation. Okay, Again, the same idea. So we are starting with NERF. Uh, most of the slides are taken from Yoni Kasten and uh, Dolevo Free, so maybe you are part of you are familiar with it. <clears throat> the first uh, work is called NERF, okay, which is a short uh, acronym for representing seen as neural radiance field for biosynthesis. It's a very nice work. The idea is the following: you take input image, you encode by optimization the uh, scene of these input images in a neural net, okay? And then you are able to render new, new views, okay? What I would like you to remind from this situation is the following uh, nice uh, uh, property. NERF stores a volumetric scene representation as the weights of an MLP, like what we had before exactly, where, where it trained on many images actually with known position of the camera, OK? So after training, we have the scene representation as the weights of an MLP. I, have, I can represent the scene by the weights of the MLP, OK? Let's move on. So what happens in inference at the inference time? We'll dive it in more detail later on, just let you know. When I would like to render an image, that's it's the idea, from some uh, camera or point of view, I shoot a ray, a, a ray, and on the ray, I, I'm sampled in, in, uh, um, in uniform uh, intervals points on that ray. These points, the location of the point in X, Y, Z, and the direction of the point is going to be introduced into the trained neural net. The output is going to be color and density. In a minute, I'll explain what is density. And then, <clears throat> You integrate those values to get the value on, on the, uh, the pixel that you're interested in, OK? OK, <clears throat> I would like 
so it's it's look to it look like this. Um, we have a bunch of uh, uh, images with camera poses. The the position of the cameras are known. Okay, and this is the input for the training process. Okay, many many images and camera poses are in of the same scene, the same static scene are introduced to the neural net, and you train the neural net. And then when you want to render an overview, you take some uh, position of the camera with direction, and you can render a new image. OK? And it looks like this. This is a, a collection of uh, images, and this is the resulting uh, new rendered views from after training the neural net. Okay. I would like to uh, draw your attention that here we are speaking about neural volume rendering, okay? And when I, I speak about neural volume rendering, I mean that you trace a ray into the scene, but you take the integral over that ray, okay? Okay, so you take samples of the, on, on this ray and you accumulate the samples on that ray, okay? Take the integral. Um, so in some sense, the MLP encodes a function uh, that uh, uh, it's uh, based on the three coordinate of uh, uh, on the three coordinate and uh, uh, give us quantity like density and color, and then we integrate these quantities to yield an image. Okay, this is uh, uh, the idea of neural vol volume rendering. I would like to emphasize that the key point here is integration over the ray. Okay, very important to, to remember it. Um, actually, NERF is neural volume rendering rather than implicit neural representation. What do I mean by that? It is not level set representation, but it's coordinate based scene representation. Okay, it's not like what we had in the beginning of the talk, what we had in the second part of the talk later on. It's something else. It, it's neural volume rendering as it take a ray, integrate of the ray, over the ray, and then you generate your image. Let's see what is exactly done. And let's start with the scene representation. So if the scene is repre repre represented by MLP, <clears throat> the input to uh, the MLP is spatial location and viewing direction, OK? And the output is the volume density, which stands for if you want uh, to think about it, uh, uh, can can be opacity or uh, uh, how much matter you have in a point. It's a number between, uh, it's a non-negative number, okay? For example, uh, the air is uh, close to zero. The density of the air is close to zero, for example. And you have, you have some uh, material like uh, iron or I don't know, something like this, you have greater uh, value than uh, zero, okay? And in addition to the uh, volume uh, density, we have the radiance emitted the direction, at the direction that we're interested in at some point x, y, z. Okay. So why I'm showing you this uh, 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 picture? Because we just said that uh, the radiance emit, uh, we have the radiance emitted direction in some direction theta phi at the point x, y, z. And I want to uh, remind you that this is very important. We also know from the previous lecture that the viewing direction is very important when you have specular materials or uh, uh, materials that reflect uh, from different direction in different ways, like here, for example. It's very important to take into account the viewing direction. Then that what they, that's what they did in this work. For example, you have the same scene and from different viewing direction, Okay, this point, which is exactly the, this point, looks different, totally different from uh, in, in this viewing direction and this, this viewing direction. Okay, and if you uh, take a look uh, at, from all viewing direction at, at this point, you will see that from each direction you will see something else, also here and also here. So this is a very important issue that is it is taken into account in this work. Okay. So uh, we represent the scene uh, as the, uh, by a multi-layered perceptron uh, with the nine layer, and uh, this is a number of the channels. The input is spatial location and viewing direction, and the output is going to be like we just said before, RGB color and density. Okay. 
So uh, after training, the, the scene, okay, the, spe the, the specific scene, the specific static scene is encoded in the multilayer perceptron, in the weights of the multilayer perceptron, and then you can do inference, okay? You can take novel views, okay? Actually, <clears throat> what is done in practice is that uh, the spatial location affects the density itself, but the viewing direction does not affect the density. The spatial location and the viewing direction affects the color. And this is good for us because the density does not depend on the viewing direction, but the color, the, the, the radiance, does depend on the viewing direction. That's what we saw in, the, in our previous lecture. Okay, actually the viewing direction can be uh, de uh, denoted by uh, just one vector, unit vector. When you take vector on the sphere, you call it uh, W. There is a direct relation between W and theta and phi. Okay. <clears throat> so let's take a look at uh, uh, the very nice animation here that uh, uh, start from the following situation. You have many, many uh, 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 images at known poses of camera. I know the center of the camera, I know the direction. And now you want to render a new image, okay? So you start uh, with uh, some uh, uh, center of camera and viewing direction. You shoot a ray, okay? On the ray, you, you take the samples, X, Y, Z, and the ray direction. You introduce it into the neural net. <clears throat> and you get RGB and density. You put it on the sample point, and that, like we said before, we integrate the information to get the value at the point of in, at the point of interest, a pixel of interest. Okay. This is this is what is done in inference, and when you do training, you do it for many many images together, and you uh, get a trained uh, layer, a trained uh, MLP. Okay, sorry for that. Just a minute. Okay. So in details, what happens? What happens in the volume rendering? Okay. We, we said that we shoot a ray, for example, this ray. Uh, the ray is parameterized by the origin of the ray, by the direction of the ray, and by some uh, free parameter t. Sigma is denoted uh, denotes the volume density. And then uh, T here in this uh, axis uh, denotes the distance from the pixel to the, uh, uh, to, the in, uh, to the direction of the of the scene, okay, of the object of the scene. Okay, what we see here, we see here uh, the density, which starts very low, and then something it, it hits something, okay, the material, and then becomes higher, and then going down. And this is actually uh, the color that it meets, okay, uh, in the direction. So uh, as you expected here, you expect that here you will get the brown color because when I meet the density, it, see, it, it uh, means that I hit something and the color here is brown. So that's what I uh, prefer to get. Now, <clears throat> if I'll take another ray, and I'll shoot it from here. The density will be high here and high here with different color. However, the visible part is this one. Okay, I, I see from here. So I would like to neglect this part. Therefore, I would expect to get uh, uh, the orange color. Okay. So all of this is mixed in a very uh, a simple scheme like this. You have a ray. Uh, you uh, 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 sample the ray, okay, like this, like what is uh, illustrated here. And then uh, you would like to predict uh, the uh, color on that ray, which is called R, okay? And this is actually a combination of few uh, elements. The first one asks the question, are you there, okay? Are you present? which mean what is the density so let's it actually is one minus e by minus this think that if the density is going to be zero this is going to be one close to one 
and then you are not there. I don't have to take it into account. You don't have density there, okay? By the way, delta i is the uh, size of the subinterval, okay? Then, moving on, I, I, I'm asking myself, are you visible, okay? What do I mean by that? I'm accumulating one minus alpha j till the point that I'm looking at, okay? So I'm visible, I'm visible, I'm visible, and then I'm going to be not visible, like what we want, okay? And when we accumulate all of this together with the color, okay, we are going to get uh, the prediction on, of the color on the ray that we shoot from the camera towards the, the scene, okay? Now, the, main, the, the next question is how to sample, okay? And uh, this is uh, uh, the idea behind the sampling they suggested. If we sample in, in a very low resolution like this, <clears throat> we can miss important parts. That's pro it's problem. However, if we sample exhaustively like this, okay, uh, we, we, we waste uh, work on these unimportant uh, uh, places, and also we do not sample very well this important place, okay? So what is the idea is to combine fine sampling and coarse sampling together okay by uh, the following way uh, you you uniformly sample in a coarse manner okay and when when you uniform sample in the coarse manner like this uh, you will uh, get a, a some a, a, a predicted values for a, the color from the coarse uh, sampling and also the density and then you also sample uh, in, in a non-uniform way, okay, sample in important regions, okay, where the density is going to be high, okay, like this. How it is going to be done? It's going to be done by training two networks together, the coarse one and the fine one, and the loss take into account together the two uh, networks. You scan all the rays that you want to scan, and you compare the uh, predicted a value from the course uh, a net towards the uh, what what you have uh, in uh, in uh, ground truth and the uh, predicted value from the final net against what you have from the ground truth okay this is the idea this is the way they uh, they uh, apply a non uniform uh, a sampling which is not uh, in, which is non uniform okay okay now what about the inference we, we remember that we have the spatial location when you have the viewing direction and the, we have the encoded scene in the uh, multi-layer perceptron and the output is going to be the color and the density so i uh, just remind you that what you had in the beginning that in the in the uh in the inference you actually uh, shoot a ray and uh, you uh, place uniformly sample on that ray input to the multi-layer perceptron getting values and actually make the integration that we described before okay but <clears throat> what about high frequency details okay it's well known that in uh neural nets the smooth parts the smooth mode actually it's equivalent to what we said in the beginning of the of the lecture the smooth uh, uh modes are going to be converged much faster than the high frequency modes okay so it looks like this if this is the ground truth if i'm not taking care in a special way the high frequency with frequency detail i can lose the high frequency detail that i have here for example this uh, white plate and other uh, details okay so um this uh, problem uh, which is well known in neural net, how to treat the high frequency detail, uh, was, uh, they, they suggested to do the following issue. They suggested that uh, uh, actually um, will not take into account the uh, point and the viewing direction as a direct input to the net. We'll do something else. We'll, we'll introduce what is the, what the, it's, it's well known, it's called positional encoding. What do I mean by that? I take each point and each direction and uh, I'll uh, uh, 
take that uh, uh, argument and uh, calculate uh, the values of these arguments in a series of sine and cosine we starting from low frequency to very high frequency like this okay and this is going to be the input to the network okay so starting from from smooth sine and cosine to very oscillatory sine and cosine okay and this positional encoding will be the out, the input to the net, to the network not the just the p and the viewing direction okay and this is very very useful and you are going to see some nice result and to see how the positional encoding affected the results okay so here for example nerf uh, comparing to a very uh, <coughs> competitive uh, uh, methods it seems more smoother, it seems in more details, and it seems that it's really in, in a rendering because the nearest neighbor is not very nearest, it's just very novel, indeed novel new uh, rendering. Here are some more examples. You see the, it's quite smoother, it's nice, you have, it has nice detail. It seems that the viewing direction indeed affect the results. For so example, look at the lower plate here. Okay, the reflected properties, the specularity that you see here, all of them depend on the viewing direction. Now let's take a look at real scenes. This, no doubt that this seems very, very good relatively to this, to the competi competitive uh, 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 method. So in the ablation study, let's understand what is uh, uh, why some ingredients are very important. So this is the ground proof, and this is the result from their method. <clears throat> if it's, it's, it's not view dependent, I miss uh, some reflecting properties that I have from here. I don't see it here, for example. And as you will see before, it's without positional encoding. I miss the high frequency details. Also, you can uh, uh, understand from here the, the importance of the positional encoding. Here, for example, you don't see uh, the leaves very well, like you see here, for example. You can zoom in, and you can see the difference, okay? Very, very important. So, to summarize, what is NERF? Novel view synthesis by volume rendering, by reintegration, where the viewing direction is taken into account. <clears throat> and the scene is encoded in the MLP weights, okay? Okay, when you want, and when you want to take a novel view direction, we saw how to do it by the reintegration. And uh, actually, uh, this is to remember that the scene encoded in the uh, MLP architecture, okay? So what about a break? What do you say? Well, I have several questions if you possible, well, even in the break. What? I have several questions about this. So if it's possible. Let's do it after the after my uh, my when when we finish the, the class, okay? Okay. Okay with you? Okay. Okay. So I'll uh, pause the recording and let's be back at uh, 10 15, okay? So we're going to speak uh, on another two uh, very nice work, uh, which also learned from raw data, from two-dimensional images. Um, but here, they indeed build on implicit neural representation with level set representation. And actually, uh, we can ask ourselves why it's important to represent the surface it's itself. Why the issue with the volume rendering and presenting the volume by density is not enough. And uh, actually, there is an answer, beautiful answer that I, I can. Um, so it seems that volume rendering or estimation of density of volume, things like this actually does not give accurate surface reconstruction. For example, in a new paper, uh, which is called UNISERV from this year, uh, they made the following uh, uh, very simple experiment. They took three scans, 
like you see here, and they, they uh, thresholded uh, uh, the density by one, by 10, by 50, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They, they built the mesh. Um, and actually, as you see, uh, there is no one value that is good for, for all the meshes. It's not like the zero level set that you know that zero is it's, it's a, a good uh, a surface uh, a representation. And also, it, you see, it's, it's quite noisy and quite, quite problematic. So the idea is indeed to use the implicit neural, neural uh, uh, representation by using level sets. This is the idea, not, not the volume representation like what we saw before, OK? So uh, I would like to represent the surface as a level set of implicit neural representation. But here we have some kushia, some problem that we have to solve. As you remember from the last lecture, uh, when we shoot a ray, we know how to compute the uh, intersection between the ray and, and the mesh, like what it simplified here. But how we are going to do it with implicit neural surface? So how we are going to say what is the intersection between a ray and implicit neural surface? This is the problem that we need to solve somehow. OK? And actually, uh, a nice paper by uh, uh, Matan Atzmon that, that I just uh, uh, spoke about before, and other people from the group of Yaron just proposed a way to, to deal with this problem with, with the intersection of some ray with implicit neural surface. OK? Uh, and they suggest how to control the level set of a deep neural network by a, a, a simple and scalable approach. Uh, they suggest how to sample the neural level set. And very importantly, because we are in a network and we want to, to differentiate, and we want to know how to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, relate between the sample's position and the network parameter, they uh, so, uh, show the way by uh, uh, implicit differentiation, how to relate between the samples of a neural uh, level set and the network parameters, OK? This is very uh, nice work. And in the two papers that are going to present next, actually uh, used uh, this nice idea. Uh, OK, so I'll start with the first one. The first one is called differential volume, volumetric rendering, in short DVR. A very nice work uh, that uh, worked with raw uh, data from two-dimensional images. And the challenge in the following, we would like to infer implicit 3D, 3D representation without any 3D supervision by training uh, the MLP on images taken from a static scene, again, with known camera poses, OK? But now, without the volume idea, just with the level set idea, OK? Actually, it's not level set, it's occupancy maps, OK? Like what we had in the beginning of the talk. And the aim is to render novel view images. And the approach is by differentiable renderer. And we'll see everything. I hope everything is going to be clear. So uh, they have two networks, the occupancy network and the textured field network. And in the occupancy network, the input is a point in R3, and the output is probability of, of the occupancy. In the texture field network, the, uh, the, the input is point in R3 and the output is color. Note that here, they do not take into account uh, uh, the viewing direction, OK? They predict texture field and not like what we had before, a, a radius as a, as, a, as a function of the viewing direction, OK? Uh, and this affects the result, of course. Also, uh, now uh, note that uh, the two networks are uh, actually uh, implemented in a single network with two heads. And let's see what is going there. So the idea is the following. Again, I want to render an image, and the, I, I know the camera position, and I want to understand what is the predicted value on that is obtained at pixel i, a pixel, sorry, a pixel u. So I'm uh, uh, looking at the pixel U. I'm shooting a ray. I'm making samples over this ray. These samples give me different value of x, y, z. They are introduced into the neural net. And the neural net 
output occupancy values of this uh, of, uh, of this of this x y z, okay, and then I'm going to uh, to to dive into everything, and then uh, having this we can predict the depths. In a minute we'll see how, and after predicting the depth, we are going to predict the texture at that pixel, okay, and then we'll have some rendered image, okay. Now let's dive into the first part how you evaluate the occupancy values and how you evaluate the predicted depth, okay? So this is done, as I said before, by sampling. So this is the ray, and we have <coughs> a, a many 3D points on this ray, uh, denoted by P1 to Pn. Actually, you uh, uh, take this point and you predict uh, the occup occupancy value between 0 and 1 for this point. And when you, when you meet the change, which is close to, uh, to uh, 0 0.5, okay, this is the first occupancy change. You apply a, a root finding algorithm method in this interval to predict the depths, uh, uh, the, the depths, okay? So it goes like this. You take the interval and you look for P such that the occupancy map is going to be 0.5, and this is done using a uh, sample, another uh, bunch of points in this small interval. And then you apply a, a, some root finding algorithm, for example, the second method, and you find the point for which uh, uh, the occupancy is the decision boundary as, you, as we saw before, okay? And then you can predict the depths which we call here D star, okay? D hat, sorry. Okay? Is it clear? Okay, so uh, this is the idea with the sampling. Now, having uh, the predicted depth, okay, we want to uh, uh, predict the texture, okay? According to the, to the predicted uh, uh, depth, okay? So, uh, um, it's going to be uh, like this. Um, you would like to predict the texture. And th let's take a look at this uh, illustration. So this is the, uh, the decision boundary, where, for example, f theta is equal to 0.5. We shoot a ray, OK? Uh, we predicted the depth d hat. And actually, if we predicted the depth d hat, we can immediately uh, 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 calculate the uh, point in R3. P theta is in R3, P hat is in R3. D is a scalar, OK? And we can do it using the uh, equation of the ray, which says that P hat is actually the origin, which is a vector plus another vector, which is direction, time, a scalar, d hat, okay? So if I have the predicted depth, I can, what they call, unwrap and go back to R3 and say what is p hat, okay? Having p hat, we are going to predict the texture, okay? Like this, okay? This is the texture prediction. Is it clear? No, can you explain again? This one or the previous one? Both of them. OK. So here we uh, made some sample. We take some sample. We use second method. We found the decision boundary. This is the decision boundary, where which p gives me 0 0.5. OK? And we predicted, using this, we predicted the depth. Depth is a scalar, OK? Just scalar, d hat, OK? Now, we would like to predict the texture, okay? So we have the hat, okay? And we move on, and we understand that given the hat, which is a scalar, I can use the ray equation to go back to ask myself what is the corresponding point in R3, okay? So p hat is in R3, and actually is parameterized by R0 plus the direction vector W times this d hat, which I just predicted, 
So I would know what is P hat, okay? What is X, Y, Z in R3? Having knowing that, I can go on and predict the texture on this 3D point and can have some value on this pixel, okay? Okay. It is not so clear. What do you mean by texture, maybe, for me at least? Texture, okay. It's not clear because texture, think about it, color, that's it. No radius calculation, no view dependent calculation, just color. What is the color at this pixel? Okay, so you have to it's just. RGB. To see that I understand, you have one network that uh, maps colors and one network that maps the surface. Right. But actually, it's the same neural net. It, they are implemented together. There are two heads for this neural net. Yeah. Okay, so it's just in order. Okay. Okay. Yes. It is a delicate point, the issue of the texture, because uh, it affects not very good the results that you will see later. And, but uh, even with this problem, it is a very nice work, I think. Uh, it's pioneer work, that's what I think. Uh, Okay, so let, let's try to understand what happens with the loss and what is the problem and what we have to solve in order to be able to calculate the loss and to optimize. That's what I want to, to try to explain. So the loss is the uh, uh, L1 loss between the predicted image, the, the value of the color at the predicted image, sorry here, and the true image. Okay, this is the loss. Now, um, here it is. You would like to minimize the loss with respect to the network parameter theta using gradient descent method. So we need to compute gradient descent of the loss with respect to the network parameter theta. Okay? And here is the problem, which is related to uh, how should I uh, uh, explain my uh, situation that I'm making samples, and I still want to, that with these samples are going to be uh, differentiable with respect to the uh, parameters of the network, okay? I would like to, uh, to explain it. So this is the idea of the differentiable renderer, okay? I would like to calculate the loss. This is the loss. And recall that uh, I u hat is actually uh, the prediction of uh, the neural net at the, at the point p hat, okay? Like, like, like this. And in order to calculate the gradients of the, of the loss with respect to the parameters theta, actually, I would like to calculate d i hat u with respect to theta, okay? And actually, uh, uh, this is the expression uh, because i u depends on a, a p, a p hat. I need by the chain rule first to calculate this with respect to theta and then to calculate this times this with respect to uh, the parameter of the of the network. Okay. If you just look at it, you will see uh, that the dimensions are okay. This is uh, is going to be a vector row vector, okay? The, with the length of uh, the number of the parameters theta, and also this is going to be a ro same row vector, okay? Now, where is the problem? This is easy to, to calculate using the, the, the back propagation. This is okay. This is easy to calculate using, for example, autograd. This is also okay, but here is the problem. How I'm going to calculate the derivative of the sample P star on the surface, okay, with respect to the parameters of the network, okay? This is the problem. And this is the nice, uh, uh, um, uh, I would say, a, a way that they implemented in, in, the, in the algorithm. This is the, the really made nice trick. And actually, as I said before, the nice trick is relying on something which is called implicit dif differentiation, which was uh, dealt also in the paper controlling neural level set that I mentioned before, okay? And actually, in order to calculate this, okay, we see immediately from here that uh, a dp hat respect to the parameter of the, of the networks theta 
is actually W times uh, uh, the depth with respect to the parameter theta, okay? Okay, this is a, a, a coordinate in R3, this is a, a, a scalar, and this is also a vector, actually. W is a vector, okay? Having this relation, which comes immediately from here, from this relation, they came with, with the following uh, uh, relation, that the uh, uh, v, d theta star with respect to the parameters of the uh, uh, network uh, theta can be expressed as something which I know how to calculate, okay? This is I know how to calculate. Actually, times a number. This is a number because this is a three by, sorry, this is one by three, and this is a three by one. This is a number, the inverse of a number. And actually, this helped them to solve uh, the issue of the differentiation of the loss with respect to the parameters of the, of the network, theta. And they implemented it and could solve the idea of a, 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 how to render in a differentiable way. Although I'm sampling, although I'm, I'm, I'm controlling the neural level sets, it's not easy, but it's possible to calculate this a, a derivative. And having calculation of this derivative by implicit differentiation, I am able to do a differentiable process and to calculate the loss and to make training and to move on. Okay, this is the trick. Uh, the main trick, I think, in this uh, in this work, very nice trick. And they used it and uh, actually um, um, paved the way to other uh, uh, papers that used uh, this idea. Okay, so um, this is the reason that it's called differentiable render. Okay, this is, is opposed to what we saw before for NERF. In NERF, we didn't need to go into this problem because there we integrated point over the ray okay so it's, it wasn't it, won't, uh, it didn't have uh, it wasn't a problem here we take samples we go over the level sets we sample them and we need to know how to differentiate over these samples okay so this is the idea in a minute, no need a minute, in, in a few uh, more slides, you'll see some uh, results uh, using DVR. Uh, just I want to summarize before we are moving to the next uh, uh, paper. So to summarize, uh, DVR represents the scene by training over uh, two-dimensional images. It uses implicit occupancy maps. It renders novel view images. By using differentiable renderer for, for inferring texture field and not light field radiance like what we had before, they neglect the view dependence. And also remember that the camera poses are known. Okay. Um, okay, I'm moving on to uh, the last work that I'm going to describe in this talk. Actually, this, this work is uh, Tuzeret Mohon Weizmann. Uh, led by uh, Lior Yariv and uh, uh, other people uh, from uh, the group of Yaron and the group of Ronen. Uh, this is called the uh, multi-view neural surface reconstruction uh, by distangling, disentangling geometry and appearance. In short, it's called IDR, implicit differential rendering. Okay? And here, uh, and here we represent uh, a scene uh, by, uh, so it should be a slide on IDR are based on slide of Yoni Kesten and Yori Arif. Sorry for that, it's just a mistake uh, <coughs> down here. So uh, so th this, these slides uh, are taken, part of them I taken are based on the slide from Yoni and the Leo. In this work, same idea as before, we represent the scene by training over images, render novel view images. Here, the, differential, we differ, the differentiable render is by controlling neural level set of sign distance implicit neural net, not occupancy map. There is a decomposition, and you will see later on why and how, between the geometry and the appearance. 
we introduce rich light uh, field representation and also the camera poses are not needed to be known accurately we can have some rough estimation of the camera poses and we can uh, uh, optimize also for the camera poses okay so let's move on so the idea is the following we have you have a bunch of images uh, and you would like to uh, infer three things geometry appearance and cameras okay and the idea is that you want to uh, uh, decompose between these uh, ingredients what do i mean by that i do i mean by that that for example here for example we have a hole in the surface I would like it to be a hole and not just a dark up a dark color uh, I would like it to be a hole in, ge in the geometry and not just a dark color that will not express well the geometry so I don't want to mix between the appearance and the geometry okay and this is the idea uh, okay and this is done in the following way uh, all the ingredients, the geometry, the appearance, and the camera parameters are going to be introduced into some differentiable renderer. You can think about it like this. In a manner that it will, uh, we will be able to calculate loss between the ground truth image and the predicted image, like what you saw before in DVR when we spoke about differential renderer. As you imagine, the geometry is going to be presented by some uh, neural uh, net, in an implicit way, by the zero level set of a neural net. The appearance includes the light and the material, what, like what we had uh, in the last lecture when we talk about materials and lights. And we are going also to refine the camera parameters when we get them in some rough, uh, we get some rough estimation. Okay. <clears throat> so let's uh, start with the with the inference. Okay, let's try to uh, to understand how we view how we synthesize novel uh, novel view. Let's say that I already have some MLP or a neural net that is trained, and now I want to get a new uh, a new uh, image, a rendered image. So I have the camera parameters. At some position, at some direction. Okay, now I'm shooting a ray, like what uh, uh, we understand before. And now I would like to, uh, my, to ask myself, okay, how could I find like what we had in, in the mesh representation? How could I find X star on the surface? How should I know X star on the surface? This is implicit representation. Okay. Uh, but since I have implicit neural representation that let me have the sign distance under the assumption that the geometry is represented by zero level set i can do the following thing i can do ray tracing which is a bit sophisticated in the following way um, i'm starting from a point in some direction and i'm doing what is called spirit tracing algorithm okay since i have f f theta and f theta let me know the distance between the point to the surface expressing the fp theta i can imagine that i take a, a circle with some radius according to this distance which i know okay and move on according to this distance so now i'm quite uh, far so my next point that i'm going to move on is this point now i'm checking again what is if f theta in this point and i'm moving on according to the radius okay Till I'm converging and getting to the uh, zero uh, level set, which is x hat. That's what I wanted to have. Okay, this is the idea. Now, it's not enough to have x uh, x, x hat. I, I would like to understand what is the appearance, what is the color, what are the lights, uh, and and to take it. Okay, and to put it on the corresponding pixel that I'm interested in to. Okay. So for this, we have another uh, MLP, uh, which we call a neural renderer, okay? So I'll take the point and I'll put it in, into the neural renderer. I'll get the RGB, very good, and I'll put it at the corresponding pixel, okay? Now, 
Um, it's not enough. Why it's not enough, as you saw before? Uh, having the point without knowing the viewing direction is problem. Why? Because the color is view dependent. For example, here I have a brighter due to reflectance properties of the skull. I have, I have reflectance properties here other than this, like what we had in the BRDF in the last lecture. Okay? So I wanted to take it into account. Anybody has an idea how to take it into account? In the neural net? Actually, it's, not, it's straightforward. In addition, uh, so in a minute we'll see. So this is just ex ex simplifying the uh, uh, different viewing direction from here and from here. And actually, in order to solve this problem, I'm going to introduce not just the point in R3, but also the direction, okay, V, into the neural rendering, okay? This is going to help me to solve the problem of the viewing direction. I want to be also, uh, uh, I want to depend also on the viewing direction, okay? <clears throat> okay. Now I'm asking my, myself, okay, uh, so is, this neural renderer has to memorize all the uh, entire the entire light field which is which depend on the viewing direction and the point or can i do something which is even more uh, sophisticated actually i would like to ask the following question say that i have some geometry and i have some other geometry do you think it's possible to render one geometry with the renderer of the other geometry that that's the question so can we render a different geometry with the same renderer which means that i can they take the neural renderer and they take two different geometries and actually i want to to, to render with with the same neural renderer is it possible okay and actually it's possible and this can be done by introducing another uh, uh, ingredient that encourages the renderer to generalize it, that it will, it will not be dependent on the geometry, just it will be uh, a decomposable neural renderer that uh, re can render any geometry, okay? So the idea is to introduce also the normal at the surface, and actually to, to compute the normal, it just, the gradient of f, it's very uh, uh, straightforward. And all in all, the neural renderer get the viewing direction, the point, and also the normal. Okay? <clears throat> now, another question. We, treat, we just treated some, uh, uh, what we call in the lecture, uh, 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 local illumination models. We didn't treat something which is global. So we add a global feature to allow uh, a secondary lighting that we saw in the last lecture and self-shadow. And this is by introducing another a, 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 a feature, which is called Z, okay? And this is also going to be introduced into the neural renderer, okay? Like, like, like this, okay? So the neural renderer getting Z, V, X hat, and N hat, okay? Um, so in the training, remember, that I'm uh, going uh, to uh, look at many images, uh, to send many rays, and to train uh, the implicit neural representation and the neural renderer, okay? But recall that in our case, uh, we optimize for theta, which is the parameter of this neural net, for phi, and also for the camera parameters, okay? So actually, uh, like what we had in DVR, we have the same problem here. I should, I should know how to differentiate X hat with respect to the parameter theta and C and R, okay? It's more complicated what, than what we had in DVR <clears throat> because here also we have the camera parameters and not that the, the parameters of the neural net, okay? So it turns out that uh, when I'm at a given situation and I have a certain values for the direction and the, the, and the sampling point, I can uh, draw a, an expression 
that can let me have to uh, let me have to express x hat as a function of theta c and r okay uh, i'm not going to explain how uh, it was derived it's complicated it re relies on the paper, paper that i mentioned before called running neural uh, uh, level set which i'm uh, reminding you here uh, such that each time that you sample you are able to associate the network uh, parameters theta to the sampling point okay just want to show you uh, the effect of uh, changing the parameter how it change in space okay so i have location of the camera rotation of the camera which uh, affects the viewing direction and some point on the surface and the s theta is the denotes the zero level set and let's see <clears throat> what happens i hope that okay when we change the location it changed the point when we change the rotation it changed the direction and it changed the point okay we change theta okay it also changed the point that we sample okay however at a certain point when we looked we look at a certain point and we denote uh, uh, at a certain point the direction by v0 this distance t0 by t0 and the normal at that point x0 hat by this uh, uh, normal we can actually uh, uh, express x hat the sampling point by cr uh, that depend on cr and theta in a way that uh, uh, this is the expression okay so it seems complicated it's not very complicated <clears throat> this is uh, c plus the t0 times the direction minus something which is known okay like here uh, <clears throat> time the, time f in a way that uh, uh, the value of x hat at the initializing uh, parameters is exactly what i had in the beginning and also the first derivative uh, in in that uh, uh, specific point are the exact derivative okay this is done using implicit differentiation. Having that, okay, we know how to continue and to optimize the loss because I know how to express x hat with respect to the parameters that I'm going to optimize over them, which is c, r, and theta, okay? I know it's a bit difficult to follow, a bit difficult to understand. Um, <clears throat> I know it, but uh, uh, just I'm trying to uh, give you the flavor and the intuition. You can read the details on the paper. Uh, this this uh, uh, development lets the IDR be, again, a differentiable renderer, like what DVR uh, just uh, uh, had. And uh, actually, I would like to move uh, for, for uh, in, a minute, in a minute for result. This is seems also very complicated this is a trained procedure that take into account all these uh, 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 variables i'm not expecting that you will follow everything that is written here but this allows me to make training in a differentiable way uh, uh, such that i have a differentiable renderer now let's move on to some result let's start with the uh, uh, um, idea of applying positional encoding like what you saw in nerf and the idea is to gain high frequency details. Here we had the same problem. If we don't do positional encoding, we miss high frequency details. And when we introduce positional encoding, it seems much better. Okay, this is a result uh, from, I think, uh, something like uh, 60 images or 64 images uh, of a scene, of, uh, of some scene, okay? And this is the uh, reconstruction result after uh, training the, the neural net. Okay, let's see more example. So uh, let's see more, uh, uh, more result. Here we compare uh, to DVR, that's what you saw before, and also to Colmet. You see immediately that the issue of DVR, that it's not view dependence, affects the geometry. Okay, and also. Call map, which is not a deep learning. Call map is just 
kind of multi-view, uh, very nice, very good work on a multi-view uh, stereo reconstruction, okay? Uh, and it's, it's also uh, here, the geometry is affected actually due to uh, the issue that it's not taking into account uh, the issues of refract refractance, okay? So <clears throat> this is Colmep and this is DVR. And IDR give relatively nice result. And also with uh, the rendering, with the, the appearance, we see uh, the result, okay? Uh, actually, uh, just to mention the DVR can be treated as something which is similar to our method in the sense that it looks only the point in R3, but neglect the normal and neglect the viewing direction, okay? Here, more results. Uh, this is a, a call map the non-deep non uh, method. This is DVR, the method that I described uh, before, and this is IDR, is uh, our, the method that I just described, uh, our method, and this is rendering results. Um, okay, another example, this is the geometry, and this is the rendering. Okay, this is another, this is another, uh, you can, get the impression of the results and the details and the, the reflectance and the lights and everything. Okay, uh, here, we, so far I spoke about uh, the situation when we fix the cameras and we know the camera. Here we train the camera in this example. And the idea is to understand that retraining of the camera affect and it affect also the geometry and affect the, the process. Because if we take the noisy cameras and put it in, in, a, in our a scheme and we do not optimize on them, look how bad result we get. Um, and if we take it into account and we optimize for them, the results are very nice in the geometry and in the rendering, okay? Um, this is uh, nice to understand that the components of the neural nets, all of them are very important. Here, what happens if we ignore the normal and what happens if we ignore the viewing direction and how, what happens if they ign we are ignoring the uh, global feature that we introduced and there, here is the complete model. So everything seems very important. <clears throat> now it's very interesting uh, issue. Um, you have that, that I mentioned before, you have the geometry and you render, uh, you render your uh, images. Now on the uh, right column here, we switch between the renderers, the renderers, okay? We also, we already have the geometry trained, but we take the uh, renderer of this and put it on this and the render of this and put it on this, on the render of the, of the neural render, okay? And that's what we get. Seems very uh, convincing that we can switch the uh, renderer as, as uh, we said before, that we decompose the geometry from the appearance, okay? Okay, now uh, this is with introducing the normal. If we neglect the normal, okay? This affects the geometry badly and also affects the results, okay? So the normal is very important. I think this is, uh, again, uh, uh, the, the, the idea of decomposing between geometry and appearance. So here we have the geometry of this that was uh, studied uh, by the neural net and we have appearance from another object. Here also the same situation and we are going to uh, take the renderer from here and put it on this geometry and the renderer from here and put it on this geometry, etc., etc., etc. And it seems that it works well. So to summarize, um, this work simultaneously learns geometry, appearance, and cameras and decompose between geometry and appearance. Uh, the differentiable renderer is indeed a differentiable renderer that can be uh, uh, um, expressed 
with respect to the optimized parameter, which is the cameras and the, and the neural net uh, parameters. And, you know, okay, so we are okay on time. Any questions? Because this is the end of the. Again, all these methods need a point cloud, right? No, all the me this method.